Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Hey Ball, I Have a Question, where you get to ask generic questions about improving at competitive Fortnite, and I try to answer them, we try to theory craft chat, tries to help a little bit, and uh, we try to get to an answer to any of your questions. So how it works is you guys in chat or on YouTube or anywhere in the community, feel free to either, if you're watching on YouTube, click the link in the description. That'll bring you to a Google forum. If you're watching live, exclamation point, hey, Bala, it'll bring you to a Discord, for, or a Discord or a Google forums where you can submit your question. All it takes is recording it with a microphone on a website called Vokuru. You'll link that to me. I will download it. I'll put you into the stream and we'll get it going. So if you want to be in the next episode, make sure you are submitting. With that said, let's get into the questions, shall we? Where are we? Here we are. First question by Oak is, I need to actually play the question and not just display it. Here we hey, are. Hey, Balls, I have a question about um, landing spots. I'm, I'm kind of indecisive on whether I should land in a populated area with a lot of good loot or I should land in a more obscure area but with uh, less loot. But in landing in an obscure area, obviously you have a higher chance of getting to late game, but your loot isn't all that great. While in a populated area, you could have really good loot, uh, but you always have that chance of higher chance of dying early game. So, what should be valued more? Cool. Thank you for the submission, Oak. Appreciate it. It's a really good question. Um, so, it's all about finding your landing spot. So, he basically said he's indecisive. He needs to figure out whether he likes to go for obscure areas with less loot or the populated areas with a lot of loot. So, so we're talking about like happy versus somewhere like fake junk in the desert, something like that, right? Um, so just like I said, it's, it's really about finding your preference. So ask yourself a couple questions, right? And these questions get a little bit deeper than you would think, right? So are you a player who's comfortable playing shambles? This is like not playing with a shotgun, for example, or not playing with any mobility or not playing with an AR or whatever. That's what I'm saying when, you, when I'm saying play shambles. Are you a player who's comfortable with that? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go for a route that doesn't have any loot, right? Because a player who shambles might actually like to drop Happy Hamlet, even though it gets contested, even though it's populated, they might actually like to drop there for the rare chance that it isn't, un or it isn't contested. Right, so the rare chance that it's uncontested, they don't have to play shambles. But if they like shambles, they can land Happy Hamlet, they can loot something, and then they can leave and do a little loot path, and then they might end up shambles or not. But if they like playing shambles, that might be a, a path. Or they just go to some obscure little spot and barely get any, um, any loot at all. So ask yourself that question. Are you a player who doesn't win a game unless they are not shambles, unless they have a gold combat, a gold scar, all the mobility in the world? Can you win games without that stuff? Because if you can't, then you need loot. But that doesn't mean that you have to drop the populated areas, right? There's always these obscure little spots that you can find tons of loot. Or my next question would be, are you comfortable pushing people for loot? If you're comfortable pushing people for loot, then you probably are better off well, actually, no, you, you could think about it again. It's, it's the two different sides. You might be comfortable landing somewhere that is populated and then pushing them for the extra loot that you wouldn't have gotten if you had just left. Or you can land somebody sh somewhere obscure and then push in. So we're, we're talking about somebody like uh, like Zexro back in the day when, when Rifts were still at Viking, right? He would land Viking and push either Snobby or Soccer for extra loot. He would do that every single game. So Viking oftentimes is, is I, I would kind of consider that like a little obscure spot in some cases, depending on the game. It's not that obscure. Obviously, it's not like a random little shack, but it isn't somewhere that has crazy, crazy good loot. Um, and you could also ob obviously debate between, you know, duos, solos and all the different modes, but it is like that. You can just push places. So ask yourself those questions because this question really is fully preference. When you think about it, when you break it down to the end of the day, this is fully preference. Do I like fighting in the early game or do I not like fighting in the early game? Okay. So it's fully preference. There's no, there's no perfect answer. There might be a perfect answer depending on the tournament. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But for the most part, it's preference. So what I would say is when we're talking about a tournament is, yeah, try out the spots, right? During the World Cup qualifiers, try out some spots in semis. You know, 
Scout some areas that are that are your options that you're comfortable com comfortable dropping at, right? Scout them out. See how many people are dropping there. Shit, land there. See how it is. Are there a lot of people dropping here? Do it again the next game. Figure it out. Is this hot, right? I, in my World Cup runs and solos, I found out pretty early that Viking was completely uncontested for most of the games in semis, right? And then in finals, it was completely different. It was getting contested by good players every single game. So you kind of have to feel it out. And it's the same thing at tournaments. It's the same thing over there. You can feel out during the warm-up games and all this different stuff, okay? And that brings me to the next thing is, right, conditioning your spot. This isn't really what you were talking about, but it is important when you're thinking about all these different spots. How can you condition your spot? And when I say conditioning your spot, I'm talking about pushing people off or teaching them that you drop there, right? This is something that a lot of pro players do a lot in all sorts of modes. I know for sure that, that Zate and Saf, at least in customs, they specifically make sure that they are such bitches at Loot Lake that nobody wants to drop on them anymore. They, are, they, will, they will hold you, they will, they will grief you, they will do all sorts of stupid shit in order to make you never want to drop there ever again. And that's totally cool. They can do that in practice. And that's actually something that they did do in, in at ESL Katowice in warm-up games uh, against Mitron uh, Kuna. It didn't actually work out. They didn't push them anywhere, but they stopped doing at all anything that they were doing in the warm-up games because then the game started mattering for them. So conditioning your spot is something that you need to think of when you're deciding, do you want to play obscure? Do you want to play um, for the populated landing spots? Because really... For me, at least, for me, it comes down to time. I don't have time to condition a spot. I don't have time to, to, know, to make people know that I drop Happy Hamlet. So there's literally zero point for me personally to drop Happy Hamlet because I can't really condition people. I can't figure out how people play there. I can't do too much uh, on a grand scale in terms of landing at Happy Hamlet, a populated area, right? Can't do, the, can't do it in Loot Lake can't do it anywhere else so i tend to prefer obscure spots and to me it doesn't it doesn't affect me because i like the obscure spots i like the random loot paths um so i'm i'm very comfortable like that okay uh you, you have to have confidence in your early game too if you want to land at these populated areas uh because if you don't then you're gonna get shit on so so i i think there is a trend i think there is a trend in the best players going to populated spots and conditioning in such a way that it's their spot, right? I don't think anybody in EU really is, is contesting Mitro and Mongol too much at Tilted, for example, in, in Duo Customs. Maybe every once in a while, right? Same thing with Zayn Saf and Loot Lake. Every once in a while, it's practice games. But when it comes push to shove at World Cup, are people going to condition or are people going to land there? Because it's the, it's the question of do you want to contest these good players who have the balls? and have the skill to actually win out fights at those populated areas. I think that's very important, right? So you have to have the confidence and you have to be good to land in these populated areas. You can't, you literally cannot be losing less than, like your early games have to be, if you're winning tournaments, if you're qualifying for World Cup, you can't lose more than probably two or three early game fights, probably less to be honest, probably less. And at tournaments, for sure less. You can't be losing early game fights at tournaments. You just can't. There's no, no way. Um, and, and then another thing that will help you get to this answer, Oak, is to research. Okay? Research. Just look at, look at how people contest certain spots. Look at how many people contest certain spots. Okay? Look at what they are coming out with. Look at their path for the rest of the game. Are they shambles because they landed in a certain spot? Ask, ask people that question or ask yourself and, and research that question. It, it doesn't have to be a pro, right? Just watch the semifinals games that you play. Watch the finals games that you play and, and figure it out. Are people leaving with something that you'd be comfortable with? Because oftentimes you probably would be in the same case, right? You don't have to figure out, oh, this is going to be uncontested 90% of the time or whatever. but but do the research and figure out, are they leaving with something that I'd be comfortable with? Are they fighting what I'd be comfortable with? Okay. And then you can kind of figure it out. 
Uh, and then the last thing I want to I want to touch on is the the obscure paths or the obscure areas don't always have less loot. I could name a couple routes that have probably more loot than or have more loot or equal to some of the more populated areas, right? Some of these baller routes, man, have insane loot potential. And I say loot potential because they're not always going to get them. I mean, it's the same thing when you land at a populated area. You're not always going to get them based on the zone unless you're landing loot lake and you get zone every time. But like H Hamlet, you don't always get the chance to loot the entire thing. You, you don't sometimes somebody lands there takes half of it and splits off and never fights you so you never get their loot so sometimes these obscure paths actually have more or equal to loot the baller paths in the in the winter biome for example have a fuck ton of loot a fuck ton of loot like it's insane so you can figure it out you can find these obscure paths that have tons of loot that you would never actually have to fight early game at all and then you'd end up with a baller and ride your way to end game you know what I mean? So, the map is vast and full of loot. Maybe terrorists too, but full of loot for the most part. Cool. There's question one. Thank you, Oak, for the submission. Let's get into question two by Sorry for Bad English, guys. There are a lot of resources on how to train your aim, but I very rarely see people talking about uh, third person Fortnite and how it messes with like training your aim stuff. Because you like Kovax is first person, obviously, and I just personally had much more success training my aim actually in game, where there is the third person, and I can build muscle memory much better there this way. All right, so I don't know about sorry for bad English is your name, but uh, your English is good, very understandable, very good. You pronounce better than most of us. So this uh, question is about basically training your aim, the resources. You, well, so really, it wasn't really a question. There was no question there. It was a statement. But I, I think it was interesting enough that uh, it'd be fun to talk about because uh, I think a lot of people have this concern on their mind about third-person aiming and, and aiming in-game versus aiming out of game and Kovacs versus whatever and Aim Hero versus whatever. All these different programs like playing Counter-Strike for Fortnite. Like these, these questions are pretty common. So I, I thought it'd be fun to talk about. And I, I think it's a really interesting topic, to be honest. But again, it comes down to preference, just like the first one, just preference, right? All that matters is that you like what you do. You're having fun doing it and you can do it for a long period of time. It's just like working out, right? You can't do a routine that you hate doing because you will not do it. So you have to do something that you like and at the end of the day all that matters is the results so i do have a few thoughts on what i prefer and what i think the majority of people should do uh because i think that we can strike a balance in terms of aim trainers versus in-game trainers or you know kovax versus playing some creative maps and stuff like that but i think I, I don't know. I, I maybe should consider some more in-game trainers, but I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why. But with all that said, I think that in-game trainers are always really, really good. And playing in-game would, uh, would be the ideal situation. And this is how people strike that balance, actually, is you'll, you'll find like the, some OCE guys like Slaya, for example, are at the top of every single Kovax leaderboard. And... Uh, so Slay is at the, at the top of every single Kovacs leaderboard, but in game, I don't think he does much, but you can't actually, you, you still have to figure out the gun mechanics, the third person, just like you're saying, you have to figure out all these things and go from there. So all he does is play a lot, right? A lot of Fortnite players actually just play the game a lot and they are able to achieve the balance between, you know, the, the in game trainers versus the whatever. That's just, that's my two cents on the balance. But yeah, like I said, the mechanics for the game make it so that you have to have some sort of in-game training to train your aim, right? Because your gun feel, your, uh, the recoil, the bloom, how the gun looks, the models, all this thing, all of these things affect your aim. But it really depends on the tools that are in the game. So right now, I don't think Fortnite has the tools that can compete with Kovacs at all. 
I don't think it at all. When, when we think about CSGO, right, think about the mechanics in that game. The, the main thing is recoil. They do have, you know, some element of that first shot being uh, accurate uh, and, and so on. And then the models. So when you, when you look at their aim trainers, when you look at the CSGO aim trainers, it's freaking fantastic. Honestly, I never, ever trained in anything else except, you know, other games that I played casually my aim in CSGO or CS 1.6 because the aim trainers in that game are so good. They replicate the models. They replicate the uh, recoil. They replicate the, the feel of the guns, everything, because it is literally the game. There's nothing to do. And the, the mechanics in the game are not random. So they're actually rewarding and trainable. They're actually trainable. Bloom, for example, is a mechanic that is untrainable. Besides tracking aim, it is untrainable and it isn't rewarding to practice with Bloom, right? Recoil is something that is trainable. So that's the difference, right? When we think about a game like Quake, I know a lot of, a lot of you guys are like, what the fuck is Quake? I've never even heard of that. Um, it basically had no aim trainers. It had nothing. It had no scenarios or anything like that that could be viable as, uh, as in-game training. The only thing that you do was play the game. So that's why actually these aim trainers have kind of spawned from these arena shooters. Uh, it, had, it had some things towards the end, uh, especially, you know, uh, some of the mods that came about in the game, like, and that was really good for movement, and that, which is another thing, movement, right? Movement is a, a thing, a, a factor in aim that little, that, that people don't think about at all, right? So Quake was a game like that. So it had nothing. It had literally nothing. So you had to use external tools. In Fortnite, I think it's half and half, right? The tools are kind of there, kind of. But again, the mechanics of the aim are not rewarding. You can't track how good you are improving with your aim besides like first shot accuracy because of Bloom. You can't do it. So that sucks. You, you don't have infinite ammo. You have to reload, which sucks, right? You have so much downtime. You have to reset the map have so much downtime um your movement is really weird there's almost no good build and shoot scenarios almost none there are some that are starting to pop up around but even then i think it's limitations from creative and not anything else right so so let's get back to the, the third person thing oh tim's saying we have insta reload and creative and infinite aim mats but still plenty yeah okay uh, I'm, I don't play those maps at all. I maybe need to uh, investigate a little bit because I do feel some sluggishness in certain situations, especially as it comes to like models and stuff like that. But are there models that really replicate the skins in the game? I don't think so. I don't think there are any bots, for example, that are literally going to be a no skin or, uh, whatever the most popular is elite agent, for example, right? There's none of that, a banana skin. You can never practice on how to aim on a banana skin. So Anyways, let's let's get to the third person part of the question or the, the statement, I should say, um, because I think first person versus third person in aim practice is a complete placebo. And that's not to say that it doesn't matter, but I think it's a complete placebo. Why? Because sensitivity in first person versus third person, your sensitivity, if you match it, is going to be the same. So you swing your mouse, it's going to be exactly the same thing, right? So it might feel, you know, that you shoot differently, but it is placebo. At the end of the day, though, that feeling matters. It really does. That feeling of, you know, you are not practicing the same because there's third person matters a lot, right? Feeling is something that people underestimate and aim. That's why I'm talking about the model differences, right? You can't just practice against shooting boxes and Kovacs because... You are not building the, the, the connection in your brain that the aim that you need to, to focus on is shooting the guy in the face, shooting the elite agent in the face, right? So it's the same thing with third person versus first person, right? If you don't have your model in the way, then you're not, you're literally not doing the mind connection or whatever you want to call it, muscle memory, any of that. You're not doing that at all. So that's very, very important, but it is placebo. You, you will still get very heavy benefits from first person aim trainers or first person shooters in general, right? But again, you have to play the game because there's so many things that matter. Movement, models, gun control, all that stuff, okay?
So I, I don't think that the aim trainers in game are there yet, even when you when you think about third person. What I do think, though, there are other tools that are really, really good and underutilized. Turtle Wars are the best, I think, aim training in the game right now because it integrates everything. It integrates building. It integrates third person peaking, which I think is more of an important aspect to aim and uh, aim as it relates to third person in general. I think third person peaking is more important than, you know, having your model in the in the in the image or in the video. So, yeah, I, I think Turtle Wars is, is kind of similar to like a DM in Counter Strike, like, like a deathmatch in Counter Strike. It integrates everything. OK. But again, it's preference. It is totally preference. The way that you train does not matter. All that matters is that you get results that you like. So, Mr. Sorry for bad English, if you like your creative map scenarios that train your aim, then feel free to stick with it. It's, it's like arguing, you know, the, the fitness heads who argue that powerlifting is better than weightlifting, is better than Olympic lifting, is better than bodyweight fitness. Like, all these different things, as long as you get the results that you like, that's all that matters when it comes down to aim training. So for me, I prefer Kovacs and then playing the game. And then I like those maps that integrate like an edit course with aim training. But at the end of the day, it is just preference. As long as you get the results that you like, you're chilling. All right. Thank you for the question. I wish you would have put your real name next time. Your English was great. We don't, we don't judge anyways. So I, w I wish you would have put your real name so I could thank you. But we're going to move on to the next question, which I love. I love, I love this question so much. So what is good. the best way to gain chemistry with teammates other than playing arena and customs? So I cut off the beginning of the question. I'm going to replay it. What is the best way to gain chemistry with teammates other than playing arena and customs? All right. So very simple question. Very, very simple question. What is the best way to gain chemistry with teammates other than playing arena or customs? Okay. I, I love this question. It is a... Um, it's very important to me that I have chemistry with my teammates. So let's start with what, what is chemistry? What is chemistry chat? Uh, I, I would say that there's, there's probably two different types of chemistry. The, the, there's the one where you just have a good time with each other at all times. And like, no matter what happens, you guys are really, really like good friends. You always are continuing forward and never moving backwards with each other. Um, and then there's like the Zayt and Saf type of chemistry, which has an element of what I just said, but it's just like they don't have to talk to each other. They just do, right? There's literally just, uh, you, you watch them and you're just wondering how the hell, there's no way that they talk to each other and plan that out. There's no way. They just know what each other are going to do. I think that is the more relevant chemistry, but they're, both of them need each other. Both of them need each other. So that's what chemistry is in my mind. Maybe you guys disagree. Let me know. Uh, but the next question I have is, is, is chemistry really needed? Okay. Is, is chemistry needed? Do, do you really need chemistry with your teammates? I say no. You don't need chemistry with your teammates. You don't need to love your teammate. You don't need to be friends with your teammate. I mean, we've seen many, 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 many examples of this throughout sports, throughout esports, throughout any relevant esport that you don't necessarily need chemistry with your teammates. You can have good communication, which will replace that, that good chemistry. But I think the best teams will always have a balance of the two. And I think chemistry will outweigh communication. It is so much easier to play with a team. This is the chemistry thing. It is so much easier to win and do really well with a team that you have really good chemistry with versus the comms. The effort that you need, if you don't have chemistry, to push your comms into such a high level that you are effective and good at whatever you are you're playing um, is, is massive. The difference is massive, huge. So you, you do need a balance, but I think chemistry is more important, but I don't think you need it, right? I don't think you need it. I think you can over communicate or, or, or just communicate really, really well and do the same thing that you would do with chemistry. 
because there's so many examples. Like I, I think of simple in Counter Strike, right? I, I feel like he is one of the most difficult guys to play with at times because of how his demeanor is, all that stuff. That doesn't mean they don't have chemistry, but I feel like watching him and and seeing the stuff that he says, thing, seeing his demeanor, all these things. I feel like personally, I would not have chemistry with him, and I know for sure that there are teams that he's been on that he hasn't had chemistry with his with his teammates. So, yeah. That's why I think of Michael Jordan, for example. He was a prick. He was, he was a dickhead, right? To his teammates, even, right? He even got fight. He got into fights with people all the time. But he was just so good, and he would make his teammates better. But he didn't have. I don't think he had chemistry. So, all right, let's let's get into how to actually build this, right? So sometimes it's it's just there. I've been on a couple of teams that chemistry is just there. You just you just mesh. You literally. You can form a team and you're just, you just have it. You just, there's no switch. There's nothing. You just have it. Um, that was where, where my, my best counter streak team ever who, who played really, really, really well before we, we killed it and I went to college. Um, it, was, it was literally just, we, we, didn't, we didn't do any crazy practice. We didn't really work on structure or anything like that. We just were amazing comms. And always had a good time. We we would win games literally in the entire like tournament or league or whatever. We would do this every single time. We'd just play music and just and just rush everybody. And we our 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 teamwork was just so good together. We didn't even think about it. We just knew exactly what everybody was gonna do. It was just there. There was nothing to it. And then other teams, it's just a struggle. It is so hard. You're always arguing. You are always fighting. You are always struggling to find that next step. But you can still build chemistry. So how do you do it? How do you build it over time, right? I, I think the easy answer and the simple answer is you, you, like, you, you just try to like each other and you, you try to play with each other and you do so many things together that you that you just start building that chemistry. You start becoming friendly. You start, you play so much, you talk so much that it's easy. It just comes naturally from there. So play together is the first answer. Play together a lot. Play together all the time. If you can play together, play a lot. Okay. And then play with other people. This is something that I think everybody misses. This number two here, play with other people. Why? Because nobody wants to ditch their teammate. And everybody wants to fall in this thing where they always have to play with their teammate. But if you play with other people, you're going to realize the things that your teammate does or doesn't do that you can start working on, right? So I, I, I think that is very, very important is to play with other people, okay? So play together a lot and play with other people a lot. <laughs> Obviously, that means play a lot, but we're all here. We're freaking watching a show about how to improve a competitive Fortnite. So I assume that you guys all play a lot. Work together, work together, um, and have fun, okay? So have fun, let's start with that one. Have fun, just do anything, everything you're doing, make sure you're having fun, make sure you're laughing, make sure you're, you're making jokes about each other, being self-deprecating or not, whatever. Just have fun, have a good time, don't be a dick, never get any, like super angry, just know that it's all about the same thing. You all wanna get better together, okay? Work together, when I said work together, I mean literally, Anything that you see, any VOD review or tip or anything, just send it to your teammate. Be like, hey, dude, I just saw this. And, and, and the teammate might respond, oh, I already saw that. And be like, okay, cool, nice. And then be like, dude, I, I, I can't wait to try that. Like all these things, work together. Uh, make plans together, right? You're, you're not fighting each other. You're not competing. Don't be enemies. You're not competing for each other. Or no, you are competing for each other, but don't compete against each other. Don't butt heads. Don't try to be better than your teammate. Just work together. It doesn't matter. Okay, now back to the, the playing together. Play other games together too. Do, do things outside of the game. Doesn't have to be playing games. Just do things outside of the game. Hang out, call, talk, text, right? Talk to each other a lot. Watch, I don't know, freaking watch movies together or something. Go out, to, go out. Uh, you know, talk about the news of the game. Talk about the competitive scene. Talk about anything. Just do all that stuff. Um, do all that stuff. So, okay, now let's get into the game. Let's let's get into the game. Make sure that you guys are. This is the this is building that like mind link that that Zayton Saf esque 
mind link where you just do something without communicating it, without doing anything. You just literally, you just literally do it. So how do you do that? You actually have to talk about the things that you don't want to talk about anymore, right? I, I, I was getting to a point where certain things, I, I don't actually have an example with a specific teammate, but uh, pretty much every new teammate that I have, I try to set up pinches, right? Because you know how much I fucking love pinches. Love pinches. Um, but it gets to a point where I'm like, hey, I don't want to talk about that. Whenever we push this, I'm going to go up and over. You're going to stay in front, okay? That's it. That, that's what I'm talking about. So talk about the things that you don't want to talk about. Talk about the things that you think should be a mind link that you don't have to communicate to your teammate, right? Talk about those things because then you will make those plans. You will be able to do that without thinking about it, without even, you just do it. Your teammate will know that you're going to do it and then it's over. So you can say like, whenever I, whenever I RPG, right, you should go a layer below me. Or, or you should go a layer above me. That when I have an RPG, you go a layer above me in, in, in Endgame. There you go. Never have to communicate that again, right? So, so another aspect of this is give, give each other stuff to do that they like to do. So give your teammate a thing to do that they like to do, whether that be the IGL role, whether that be the aggressive role, whether that be the guy who carries the RPG, whether that be the guy who doesn't carry the RPG, right? Figure those things out and give them to each other. That way you guys are going to be happy playing. You are never going to be pushed into a situation that you don't like to do. All right? And then you are on the flip side. You're going to be pushed into situations that you really like to do, that you excel at, that you are excited about, that you will research things about. All right? So, so assign each other these things. Give each other these tasks. Give each other these tasks. Hey, man, can you VOD review Mongrel? Because you like VOD reviewing. Right. Hey, man, you take walls. You're going to be the guy who takes walls. You're going to run up every single time. I'm going to hold or you're going to hold turbo build. I'm going to pickaxe all these things. Assign these roles. If you do that, then you're 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 already building this chemistry. You're, you're literally manufacturing chemistry. You're manufacturing things that you don't have to talk about anymore, that you will just instantly mind meld with each other because you've talked about it in the past and it's worked or you've tried it, it started working, whatever. So do those things and speak up. If, if you're doing something that you don't like to do, if you're playing support and you don't like playing support, then, then speak up about it. Shit. Maybe that's the end. Maybe because he doesn't like playing support either, then that duo doesn't really work. Right? Or compromise. Find compromises. Right? Be like, whoever's first is going to be the guy who's, who's uh, playing aggro. Whoever's second is going to be the guy who supports. We just, we trade. Right, I support, you support, I support, you support. That kind of thing. Um, so compromise. Compromise on everything. If, if there is something that you disagree about, don't fucking yell at each other back and forth. If you have an argument, solve it. Don't not solve it. If you have an argument, if you yell about, uh, about something to your teammate, you say, you're not calming enough. If you walk away from that argument without a solution, without, say, without your teammate and you agreeing and saying, okay, what we're going to do is that I'm going to calm when I'm pushing somebody. Simple. If you don't do that, then you are not going to build chemistry. Okay. And then, and then last thing is, is talk about your goals. You have to have aligned goals. I've been in so many teams where I'm like, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's my goals. And they're like, okay. And they never tell me what they want. They never tell me where they want to go. They never tell me how much they want to improve. And then two months later, I'm like, so guys, like, I want to do this. Like, I don't think we're working it. We're working hard enough for this. They're like, I'm like, do you guys want to do this? And they're like, not really, man. I'm like, what the fuck did I waste my time for this then? Like, what am I doing here? So talk about your goals. If you guys don't have same goals, if you guys don't have similar goals, you are never going, you, you are always going to end up having, having problems. Okay. But again, this is, I love this question because it, it gets so deep. And honestly, I, I, I could talk about it at super length. Super, super, super like I could keep going, but we're, we're going to end it there with these two examples. Zayt and Saf of a team that has crazy chemistry, right? Crazy, crazy, crazy chemistry with, without even talking. I, I haven't watched a stream of theirs in a while, but it feels like they don't really calm that much. And then Simple, who doesn't have any, who in my mind, I don't know the guy personally. I've never played on a team with him, but in my mind, he doesn't have chemistry with people, but he still plays best, the best. Michael Jordan the same way, right?
So you don't have to worry about these too much, but all these things you do have to worry about, no matter if you want chemistry or not, you have to worry about them to build a good team. All right, cool. Thank you for the question, Whipman. I love it. I love it. Let's move on to the next. We got two more. Or hey, Bella. We, two more? Yeah. we were in Trio Cup finals. We were in the last game. After doing really good in finals, we didn't know how to play this high level game with literally 70% of pros in it. We don't have the chance to get good practice because we are not in prac court. What is your thoughts? We got top 63. All right, Mr. Robot or something. <laughs> Thanks for the question, man. Uh, I would appreciate you guys if you used your real voices. It would make it better for production. But uh, thank you for the submission regardless, because I really like the question. So uh, basically, it came down to uh, not being comfortable in the last lobby of the Trios Cup Finals because it was so stacked and it had 70% pros. Um, and they didn't feel comfortable because... They weren't put in those situations a lot. And they, they say they're not in prac court, so they can't get the practice that simulates that. So he, he wants to know what I think about that. And then he says, we got top 63. So, so first thing I want to say, this, this question disproves itself. Well, please, if you're in chat, this question disproves itself. So you got top 63 in the Trios Cup. You're not in prac court. There are way more than 63 people in prac court. Way more than 63 trio teams in prac court. You are better than a lot of the people in Pracord. Not everybody that you place higher than of you are better than. That doesn't that doesn't mean that, but you are better than a lot of people who are in Pracord. All right. To get top 63, that means you have had to play in stacked lobbies. That means you have had to play in top stacked lobbies. Holy crap, that is some thunder. You have had to play in stacked lobbies. That means that you don't need prac court. I think this question disproves itself. Like it, it sounds like you're like, I don't have prac court, so I can't perform in finals, which clearly is false. Okay. So I, I'd say this is more of a, a question of confidence than, or an issue of confidence rather than anything else, rather than not having prac court. I think this is an issue of confidence because clearly you have played in stack lobbies before to get top 63, right? You, you are playing in, in stacked lobbies to get top 63. Even the first game, right? Sure, the quality of the games in, in a cup might be very high and then start peaking or start dipping a little and then dip very, very, very fast and then go up again. Um, but you're, you're still getting there, right? It's not like no, nobody, nobody, very few people except for like Bizzle, Zate, and and a lot of the people who have gone to like every single LAN have had experience in these stack, 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 stack lobbies. Not a single one of them. Because Pratt Court, when we were sniping, bro, they were not like this at all. They were not like this at all. Not even close. Right? I, I got into Pratt Court after TwitchCon. That shit was terrible. Even even the even the scrims before TwitchCon, they were they were not even close to TwitchCon finals, man. They were not even close. Not even a little bit. Right. And that's kind of the things that we have in, in the in the cups right now is these cup games, these cup stack games are not even close to, to land either. They are hard. But in my mind, this shit is replicable. Right. Fucking Atlantis Customs replicates it. The, the, the 60 people in, in Endgame. Yeah, man, that gets replicated quite often in Atlantis Customs. Sure. Might not be the best players. It might be a bunch of bots. But that does not mean that you are not practicing for those situations, right? Pro players make bop moves all the time, all the time, all the time. So I, I think this is more of an issue of customs. I mean, uh, of confidence <laughs> over anything, not customs. I have customs on my mind. Um, so you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out by playing. Uh, every time you make finals, you'll play it. You'll get better at these games. You will get better. You will build that confidence and you'll be like, oh, this is not that as hard as I thought it was, right? And my, my first suggestion to you because of the confidence issue, I think, would be play in anonymous mode. You should never know if you're in a stack lobby or not. You should just play it how it is. You should never worry about somebody being in the lobby. You should never see Mongrel in the lobby and start shaking and getting nervous and not figuring out what to do because any of that, right? You shouldn't see a bunch of pro players and be like, oh shit, I don't know what to do, right? So maybe turn anonymous mode on, but even if you don't, like you will figure it out. You will, you will play in these enough that you will figure it out. I have no 
doubt in my mind about that. If you play enough of these, you will start figuring it out. You will start getting comfortable. So every time that there's a finals, play, 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 play your heart out. Okay? You're not going to be instantly the best player in the world at the games that are hardest, right? That makes no sense. That's like saying that you should go from, from open league or, you know, your high school basketball team to the NBA and being a best. Like very, very, very few people do that. I think the only example of that in esports is Stewie 2K in, in Counter-Strike. I think that's the only example. Everybody else had to grind a ladder. Every single person had to grind a ladder, right? You're not going to just jump unless you are an absolute god, which very few people are. So I think you'll figure it out. But that does not mean that we can't talk about um, how to practice outside of practice because this is a really common thing, right? I, I think a lot of people have this sentiment. And I'm seeing a lot of people in chat right now all saying, well, it's still a disadvantage not to have practice. And let me tell you, no, it's not. Fucking reverse 2K qualified, and he never fucking plays any practice scrims. All he does is play arena all day. He never plays Atlantis Customs. All he does is play arena all day. Like, they almost qualified in duos. Shit. Tifu and Cloak, they barely play Customs. Barely, 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 barely ever. Tifu? You think he, he, he played solo Customs literally more after he qualified than before? Let that sink in for a while. Like, he doesn't... He's, he's one of the best players in the world, and he doesn't think that it's relevant. Like, not at all. So, this, this concept of, I don't have practice because I'm getting gate kept, so I don't have good practice, is, is BS. It's is absolute BS. I, I don't like the fact that, you know, there's a, there's a gate system, but unfortunately, that is what the scene has to work with right now, and there's very little we can do right now to change it. We're working on it, guys. We are working on... Fixing the system so that people can have a good flow through Procord, into Procord, and out of Procord without just, you know, stupid, like, ideas and VOD reviews and stuff like that. I think that's the dumbest thing in the world. The system sucks, but it is what it is, okay? And, and honestly, I've seen so many players get into Procord and then just flounder and, and, and die. And, and not die, but, like, be terrible in game. Like, I've seen so many people make Procord and then have and then have no improvement after that because Procord really the the best thing about Procord is the incentive to get to Procord. Yeah, I I see Bumpa in chat a little, a little while ago and um he was talking about our our journey to TwitchCon and us playing all we did we didn't have Procord. All we did was FMPL Champs League and Open League, right? We were in Champs League for probably like 2 3 weeks before TwitchCon happened and we qualified for the finals. Because we treated every game as an improvement. We tried to improve every single day. And we had an incentive to do well at TwitchCon. That was number one. And to get Pratcord. Okay. All of our improvement after Pratcord was so minor because we lost all of that incentive. We didn't have TwitchCon to play for. We didn't have Pratcord to play for. So honestly, I kind of think that staying out of Pratcord might be the play. For, for a lot of people, it might be the play. I'll be honest, I, I, but I still understand people want to get in practice. People think that practice is the best practice. Okay, let's let's dispel with that. That is literally done. You aren't in practice. How do you practice? Okay, VOD review a lot. VOD review, VOD review, VOD review. If you want to, if you want to play well in stack customs, you have to watch stack customs. You have to figure out what people do in stack customs to be better. Right. You have to do that. You have to do that. If you don't, then you will never, you will never know once you end up in that situation and be like, what the hell is this? How, how do I take our ground? What do, what do I do? What do I do? Um, you need to do it because you need to, to watch and figure out what works in these stack lobbies. And let me tell you, what works in those stack lobbies, it works in not so stack lobbies. In any competitive, in any competitive game, right? It it's obviously won't necessarily work in arena solos or arena. In a, arena. Um, but it will work in Atlantis Customs. It will 100% work in Atlantis Customs. If you do something that they do in Stack Customs to win Stack Customs, then it will work in Atlantis Customs. It will work in any other sort of custom that you can play. So do those things. The concepts in Stack Lobbies versus not as Stack Lobbies are very, very, very similar. They're, they're pretty much the same. They're, they're not that different at all. Um, arena is practice. I have so many people that I argue with this about constantly bump up being one of them. 
arena is practice if you treat it like practice if you treat it like practice if you ask yourself how could i have played that better at the end of your game it is practice stop saying that it's not practice stop it it is practice you need to practice something you need to go into arena before you go into arena figure out what you were practicing why you were playing arena and then practice that thing and then after the game said how could i have done this thing better that i'm practicing okay uh -uh. i don't care i don't care how light the end game is i don't care how many people are in the end game i don't care how much of a joke the other players are treating it how much people are storm fighting how much people are w king i don't give a crap you can always treat it like practice and it will be practice if you treat it that way so yeah some people in chat are saying what it's good for practice it's great for w king it's great for practice being w keyed against it's great for practicing mechanics it's great for feeling the pressure in the end game right it's great for that it's great to go into a 1v1 in the end game and feeling the pressure and having to win that game right if you have if you have pressure problems get to the 1v1 and fucking play your heart out right uh zone rule end game zone rule customs are fucking fantastic end game practice i don't i don't i don't see anybody i don't i don't think i've heard anybody say that end games and, and zone rule customs are not good but um it's really good end game practice honestly it is sometimes just as close as those stack lobbies sometimes it can do the storm surge stuff obviously there's players in there that to total bots but again pro players play like bots sometimes so that's that Woolsey. hope it helps you will get through where you're gonna where you're at right now you will get through it you will start getting better as long as you make sure that you don't have this mental block that you need to be in prac cord you will not get into prac cord if you don't break this mental block okay you will not do that at all at all so good luck man thank you for the submission uh, uh, uh. it is storming like crazy outside and that makes me sad because the motivation to go to the gym is decreasing as time goes on in this show but i am going to do it right after no matter what rain or shine here's the last question guys by zemi it is here hey bala uh my question is how do you rotate in fourth zone and in and out when you have absolutely no mobility and zone is really far I found myself dying a lot in those situations in World Cup qualies when I was trying to rotate early, but either I would get focused and die or I would get tagged up a lot and use a lot of mats. Uh, sometimes I would wait and pressure someone near me to see if they would put down a launch or back then use the rift, but a lot of the time they would end up not having anything or they would use a shadow. So then again, I'm trying to tunnel into zone and uh, I get focused and die. So how do you deal with situations like that? Thank you. Cool. Thank you for the question, Zemi. And a lot of people in chat are already answering it, but... I think a lot of people in the chat also didn't listen because he specifically said that he tries to pressure people to recycle their mobility and he tries to tunnel in, but he always gets beamed. So um, I, I, this is a very hard, hard rotate. I think a lot of people struggle. I think you have the right ideas. You have the right ideas. I think your execution is probably what suffers. Okay. So th this is a hard situation. It is very difficult. Putting yourself in this situation sucks. And oftentimes you're not going to come out alive. Which is fine. Remember, you have multiple games. You have a lot of tries. You don't have to get it perfect on the first try. You don't have to you don't have to make this rotate work, but it can work. You can do it. Okay? You should always have the confidence. And the biggest tip I'm going to say is no matter what, no matter what it's going to cost, no matter how much health it's going to cost, how much shield you're going to have to spend, how much of your mobility it's going to cost. I know you said you don't have mobility, you're very shambles, but don't ever give up. No matter if you if you get into zone with 20 HP and 300 mats, you could still win the game. You could still win the game. You could always find an impact frag. Always. Okay. So let's start with that. Um, then I then I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest you watch Mr. Savage comp games a lot because he is always shambles on the edge of zone for some reason. Literally always shambles on the edge of zone. He just loves riding the edge of the zone. When he's playing with Benji, not so much. I think Benji is the same type of player in solos. But Mr. Savage and Benji love riding the edge of the zone. And they love having these difficult rotations. 
I don't know why. I don't understand it at all, but that's something I've noticed. So watch them a lot and you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll figure out some situations. Uh, the most important ones are like the situations where you're getting spammed by like a million people. They're so quick and so fast at getting out of it. But let's, let's talk about the, the first thing you said, right? Sometimes I try to pressure people to spend their mobility and oftentimes it ends up that they don't have any mobility. So my, my response to that is you are, you are not reading properly. You're not reading your opponents properly. You are not figuring it out. You're not asking yourself enough questions about who you're pressuring and who you are going for for mobility because they don't have mobility. They are not giving off the signals and you're not catching the signals. All right. So ask yourself some questions. Are they editing a lot? Are they pre-placing a floor for a launch pad? If they're editing a lot, maybe they are looking for a path for rotation. Right. If they're pre-placing a, a place for a launch pad, obviously they have a launch pad. Uh, there's mind games. Sometimes there's mind games. You can try to pre-place a floor to try to get somebody to push you. Um, are they sitting in a cone? Right. If they're sitting in a cone and literally not doing anything, that means they probably have mobility. Right. If that's the case, are they slowly moving in the zone? Figure out who's doing that and then be like, they're not somebody I want to push at all. But what they are good for is if you don't find any other options, he's an option to follow in, right? If you use his old builds, even if it's slightly moving a little bit, if it's not that far, you can still use it, right? It gets you ever so closer and it gets you ever so cheaper on the rotation. Uh, what other questions can we, can we ask? Are, are, oh, are, are they pressuring others? Are they pressuring others? Are they opening their windows and are they shooting at each other? Because that's a signal that either they are very kill hungry, they are very psycho, or they are trying to force somebody to use their mobility. Okay, so maybe they don't have mobility. So ask yourself these questions. This is an exhaustive list. This is not. These are just things that I, I wrote down ahead of time and I, I came up with. Uh, but these are the types of reads that you should be trying to make on people. Uh, the first time I really, really saw this concept play out was when I was watching, uh, who was it? It was Vorwin and um, Finex in one of the Atlantis Cups. They got third or something like that. They literally, uh, four seconds left on zone moving, and they, they pushed a box of metal on the side of zone, and they just jumped on top of it, and right as soon as they jumped on top of it, the guy rifted, and I was like, wow. They literally just risked all because they knew that guy had a rift. They knew it. They knew it. So reading people is very important. So let's, let's talk about timing of the rotation a little bit because I think that's very important. If you, if you can't pressure mobility out of somebody, let's talk about timing, right? Early is good, but don't, go the, don't try to go the entire way. What you'll see right now, and I, I was watching, who was I watching? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember anymore, but I, I, I see all this, this, this new meta uh, arriving where people start rotating early, but they don't go all the way. They literally maybe go four boxes down, box up, see how, see how things are playing, come up with a new path, right? And then they move again. Go slowly. Take your time. Find the LOS blockers. Wait for people to build LOS blockers for you. Right? Wait for people to rotate ahead of you that you can use them. So just take your time. Take your time. Make it so people forget about you. If you run the entire way, everybody's going to be like, holy shit, this guy is running the entire way and everybody's going to focus on you. If you run a little bit, box up. Wait, wait, wait. Then people forget about you. They're like, okay, that guy just boxed up. Okay, whatever. And then you move again. Right? Um, so I think that is what you timing, right? In a nutshell. And, and I actually think that moving towards the, towards the end of the zone, like obviously not with the zone right behind you, sometimes it's okay. It depends how many other people are going to be rotating with you. It depends how many people are going to be gatekeeping you. Again, it all depends. It all depends. All depends. Uh, but these are very general questions that you can ask yourself and you're trying to answer to figure out what the right answer is in your game specifically. All right. All right. Now let's, let's, the, the. I don't know if it's the elephant in the room, but why are you shambles? All right? Why are you shambles? Because more, more, more often than not, that is the real root of the issue. I, I understand that there are games sometimes where you cannot help but be shambles because of the players you ran into, the spawn of the zone, or the way people rotated, 
or the mobility that you found or the kills that you were able to get, the inventory that you have, whatever. I get that there's situations where you're shambles. But if this is a question you're asking and you said you often found yourself in this situation in World Cup qualifiers, then ask yourself, why? Why? Is there something that you can fix before this happens? Is there a push you can make in your early game that you can avoid not having mobility in this time? All right? Is that a thing? Is there a reason why you are not getting fourth zone? Because you should be getting fourth zone. If you, if you can help it, you should be getting fourth zone. You should just be center zone and you should be getting it. Is there a reason why you're not getting that? Okay. These are the, these are the questions you should be answering yourself to try to help you fix this issue. It's not fixing this specific issue, but it is fixing the, um, the root of it, right? which is I often find myself in situations where I am rotating late in fourth zone or uh, I am rotating in fourth zone a long distance, okay? So ask yourself that. Don't be shambles. Don't be shambles. Okay. Um, so yeah, in, in that, in that, on that vein, and I think this is my last thought, is before you base... In third zone, while while you when you see the fourth zone, and you you want to move to fourth zone, ask yourself, or well, whatever it is, I, it might be third zone. I, I don't I don't know the specific timing of what you're asking. I think you're talking about the one that I'm thinking of. But regardless, when you see where it is, ask yourself, why am I basing here? Is this spot good to base if I get a bad rotation or if I get a bad zone? Can I still rotate? Can I still get to where I need to go if I get the worst possible zone? You got to ask yourself that question. Is this spot okay to rotate from with what I have? If it's not, then move to another spot. Continue moving, right? The longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. Okay? So get a better spot if you ask yourself that question and it's, this is bad. All right, guys. That's going to be a wrap on this episode. If you do enjoy this type of content, this Hey Ball, I have a question uh, show, please Talk about it in the comments, talk about it in chat, um, and submit questions because I barely have enough questions to do this. I just got enough at the last second. So thank you guys uh, who submitted the last second. You are awesome. Uh, if you're wondering how to submit questions, there is a Google form link in the description below. Or if you're in Twitch chat, you can go ahead and do Hey Bala. I have a question or exclamation point Hey Bala and it'll link you to Discord. Um, but besides that, like, subscribe, do all the things on my social media. Use code, use creator code, BALATW in the item shop, and uh, have a good day, guys.